All right, good morning, everybody. Hope uh, everybody got through the storms okay from yesterday. And uh, I will tell you that uh, I'm a little bummed because Lawrence got up here and completely stole my entire Bible lesson. So uh, I texted Darrell and I said, Darrell, Lawrence is up there giving my Bible class right now. And he said, well, you're just going to have to upstage him. So I'll do the best I can. Uh, So in order to do that, I'm going to start out with a joke. So at least I can say I got a few more laughs. How do we know Peter was a rich fisherman? How, How do we know Peter was a rich fisherman? Because of his net income. All right. What excuse did Adam give to his children as to why he no longer lived in Eden? What excuse did Adam give to his children as to why he no longer lived in Eden? Because your mother ate us out of house and home. All right. Oh, one more. What did Adam say on the day before Christmas? This one's easy. What did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. I thought you would have got that one. All right, let me find my clicker here. There we go. All right, so... Uh, We've been talking about Isaiah. This is the fourth class on Isaiah. So a quick recap. Isaiah starts out by telling the Israelites that they will be cut down like a tree and be a burnt stump. So, but from that stump, a seed will sprout and grow. So what does the, the cut down tree signify? You remember? What the cut down tree is? It is Israel being cut down because of their unfaithfulness to God and their idol worship, etc. So what what does the charred stump? What does the charred stump signify? It's a, the remnant, yes. And the holy seed, uh, the holy seed is its stump. It says there in Isaiah 6, 3 on the screen, the holy seed is its stump. So what does the new seed signify? Uh, The seed of David, the Messiah. In Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Isaiah foretells the birth of Jesus 700 years before his birth, which I like to always remind you of that, that this was written 700 years before, but Lawrence already did that this morning. So so Isaiah prophesies, as we went through the book of Isaiah, um, I'm going to kind of refresh this. Isaiah 9 1 and 2, we see a reference to Christ's ministry beginning in Galilee. In Isaiah 11, a reference to Jesus drawing the Gentiles to himself. In Isaiah 22, a reference to Christ's authority over judgment. Isaiah 25, 7 and 8, the Messiah will conquer death. Isaiah 35, Jesus would have a miraculous ministry. Isaiah 42, Jesus will be a gentle redeemer of the Gentiles. So as we go through the book of Isaiah, we see over and over kind of the Isaiah's progressing and and prophesying about Jesus all the way through the book. And so today we're going to begin in Isaiah 44, verse 3. So if you'll turn to Isaiah 44, verse 3. It says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring, 
and my blessing on your descendants. So the first part of this to me sounds kind of like a weather uh, prediction, calling for rain, for I will pour water on a thirsty land. Uh, But the second part of that verse goes a little further. It says, I will pour my spirit upon your offspring. So he's not talking about H2O, is he? He's not talking about uh, a weather forecast. What's he talking about? In Acts 2, what kind of pouring is he talking about? Spiritual spiritual pouring. He's going to pour out his spirit on our offspring. So God has a deep-seated desire to bless his people. And uh, why do you think water is used over and over again as an application for Christ? Water is life. Somebody over here? Life giving water? Okay. Cleanses, purifies. What else? It goes wherever it wants. It sure does. You look at the Grand Canyon, you can see that. And go through rock. So what happens tomorrow if you wake up and go to the fridge and try to fill up your cup and nothing comes out? And what if you call the water department and they say, hey, we're out of water. Uh, It's not coming. When you go down to the Barren River or you go down to Drake's Creek and it's all gone. It's dried up. Anybody ever thought about what they would do if that happened? You try to go to Walmart and it's all sold out. So remember, remember back in Kings when God brought a three-year drought on the land. He was showing that when you turn away from God, you will dry up and die. But with God, you will be blessed. And, and water is life. So now, now I have never experienced a lack of water like this. Uh, we've been extremely blessed in my 42 years on this earth. There's always been water in the faucet. My entire, you know, always, never had to worry about it. Um, Others in other countries and other areas are not as lucky. So water is very important to some people, and they will go to great lengths to get it. Um, The only example in my life where, you know, other than out working in the sun or something and you're super thirsty, but the only other example I could think of was in my police training when I was pepper sprayed in my eyes. And as that pepper spray began to run down into my eyes and the pain start, started to dig in and my eyes locked shut, I mean, tighter than you could imagine. And you had to take your eye and force it open with your fingers. And as you're forcing your eye open with your fingers, then you have to try to run through this obstacle course. You have to strike and kick and you have to draw your weapon and you have to give verbal orders. And while you're doing that, your eyes are just glued shut because the pain from that pepper spray is really intense. And the purpose of that training is to teach you that you can fight through it. Um, but when, you're, when you finally get to the end, after you handcuff the, your suspect, and you finally get to the end, there were some tubs of water sitting there. And the feeling of dunking your head under water when your eyes are full of pepper spray was the most refreshing feeling I believe I've ever felt in my entire life. And I dunked my head under the water and I opened my eyes and the pain immediately was gone. Immediately. Just completely gone. The problem with pepper spray is it's oil-based. So as soon as I came up for for air, the pain was immediately back. (laughs) So I took a breath of air and went right back under. (laughs) And really the only way... The only way for that to, to get better is just over time it dries, dries up. But, but the, water, the refreshing feeling of that water uh, was just amazing. And so when I think about Jesus being the water of life, um, it's just, you know, that's, that's a simple moment where I just needed some water 
But it, I can't imagine going three years without water and how hard that would be. And I think that's why Jesus uses the water as a, a life-giving, you know, something we have to have to live. And we need Jesus just like we need water. Let's look at John seven thirty seven. John seven thirty seven. So we're going to look into the New Testament where we see Jesus as water in our lives. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So it says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus will give us rivers, not just a sprinkle, not just a cup, but rivers of living water. Let's look at John 3, 5. Oh, sorry. Hang on one second on that one. I'm going the wrong way here. Can you go backwards? I'm not sure what the back button is. Bear with me for just a second. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Acts 2.17, we'll get, we'll get to this, John 3.5 in just a second. Acts 2.17, I'll just read these real fast. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So there we have the pouring again, uh, pour out spirit on all flesh. In Acts 2.39, just a few verses down, for the promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So the living water that we so desperately need is for everyone, for us, for our kids, uh, for everyone who is far off, everyone. So not just the Israelites, but everyone. So the dry and thirsty ground signifies the spiritual condition, the barrenness and the unfruitfulness. And they hungered and thirsted for righteousness. But Christ alone can quench the thirst. He can make the unfruitful barren ground fertile and able to bring forth fruit. So that brings us to John 3, 5. In John 3, 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is the living water in our lives to keep us from becoming a desolate wasteland keeps us from being a, a spiritual desert. And we are called to bear fruit in the kingdom. So without the living water, we will die in this sinful, barren wasteland we call earth. So we must be thirsty. And that's what it says in the beginning of Isaiah 44, 3. We need to be thirsty. If we are thirsty, he will not sprinkle on us. He will pour it on us continually. A continual pouring. Plenty of water. All the water that we would ever need. And we know the wage of sin is death, but Christ is the living water that sustains us. So any comments that you all might have on Isaiah 44, 3, where he says, I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Any comments on that? Any thoughts? All right. All right, the next passage we're going to look at today in Isaiah is Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 6. We're going to break this down a little bit. So the Messiah will be mocked and abused. So Isaiah 50, 4 through 6. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. 
The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. So we're going to break this down verse by verse for just a minute. So in verse 4, it says, God has given him knowledge of someone who has been taught. And if you look to John seven fifteen through 17 over in the New Testament, John seven fifteen through 17, it says, The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So they were wondering how Jesus knew all that he knew without being some kind of Bible scholar. Uh, And Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, God has given him knowledge of someone who has been taught. And verse 5, the Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backwards. And with that one, we're going to look back to the New Testament, to John fourteen thirty one. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. So why, why did Jesus obey God's will and not rebel? Because he loved? Yeah, it says right there in John 14, at the, the last part of the verse, so that the world may know that I love the Father. I, and I, the beginning part, I do as the Father has commanded. So Jesus was not going to rebel what he was supposed to do because he loved the Father and he was going to do as the Father commanded. All right. Hebrews 5.8, although he was son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So in Hebrews 5.8, he learned obedience through what he suffered. In Philippians 2 verse 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that brings us to verse 6 of Isaiah 50, verse 6. It says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. So here, the Messiah is going to be mocked and abused. And if you look to Matthew 26 and 67, it says, Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him. In Mark Mark 14, 65, And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. Another in Mark fifteen nineteen, And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. In Luke 22, 63 and 64. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? So just like... 700 years earlier in Isaiah where he prophesied that the Messiah would be mocked and abused. Here we have so many verses in the New Testament describing that this happened. So what thoughts do you have on the Messiah in this this verse in Isaiah 50, 4 through 6? Any comments? You can save them all to the end. That's okay. Are you just a reminder of how little sense it would make if I was reading it in the time when it was written? Because not only is the whole Messiah thing something that the New Testament Christians struggled with of like, is this a physical king? Is this something spiritual? Even reading it back then, just the 
person that's supposed to come and save them is also getting beaten and led to a slaughter. Like it's just Isaiah's message is very weird, and it'd be hard to kind of piece together quite what it is until you're on the complete other side of the story where you can look back. All right. Yeah. So he said it would be weird uh, for you know for for them to be reading this 700 years before Jesus came to try to understand what he's talking about. And it was even hard for the New Testament Christians to figure all that out. Um, so that's a good point. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, so as far as the Israelites during Isaiah's time would, you know, are they, for them to understand that he's talking about Jesus would be hard. It would be more likely that he was talking about himself, uh, but we know that now that that's not the case, that he was talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Thank you all. All right. Jesus, the Messiah, would be despised and rejected. Turn to Isaiah 53, verse 3. This is the main part that Lawrence stole from me this morning. Isaiah 53. I'm going to read it real fast. It's 12 verses. So if you'll read with me, Isaiah 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the trans transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was... He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore, bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. That, that always amazes me, uh, the, the detail 700 years before all this happened of how this, how this went down. And it, it's all right there in 12 verses. It's just... It's crazy. It blows my mind um, every time I read that. So today we're going to look a little closer at verses 3, where he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So if you look over at John 1, 10 through 11, it says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, 
yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. In Mark fourteen thirty four, and he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. So here we see uh, a man of sorrows. Jesus was sorrowful. Uh, he was despised and rejected. Psalm 22, 6 through 8. Psalm 22, 6 through 8. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their, their heads. He, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. So... Being a Christian is hard. It's hard to be different. It's hard to be despised. And sometimes when we are living like a Christian should live, we're, we're different. And that's one thing I'm trying to impart on my nine-year-old son is that we're, we're called to be different. We're not called to be the same as the people out here in the world. And uh, kids, you know, they don't, they don't want to stand out. They want to be just like their friends and they want to do what their friends are doing. And, and sometimes we have to stand up and and not do what everybody else is doing. And uh, sometimes uh, that brings on a little bit of uh, sorrow or a little, a little feeling of being despised or, or not being able to do what everyone else is doing. Um, and I can't imagine the feeling of what Jesus felt, living a perfect life and still being despised and you know treating people with kindness and uh, healing and uh, doing miracles and be, still being despised and rejected and how that would feel. Uh, Matthew twenty seven thirty nine through 34. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. So they're mocking him, um, telling him to come down off the cross. You know, I'm I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he didn't do that. he withstood all the pain and the grief uh, for us, and he stayed on that cross, despised, uh, being despised and rejected, being mocked. Uh, Mark nine twelve, and he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, and how is it, how it, is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? So why is Jesus a man of sorrows, despised and rejected and and acquainted with grief? Why is that? Why is a a perfect man of God, the Son of God, why is he rejected? Why is he despised? Why is he a man of sorrow? Well, one reason is that among the many things that he did for us, he was the Okay, so he's our intercessor. In other words, he's the go-between between us and God, and he has to understand where we're coming from and how we feel. And so he is feeling what we feel in our lives. Uh, and the, the weight uh, of being the sin bearer, I mean, I can't imagine the, the weight on your shoulders of being the sin bearer uh, for everyone. Um, so... You know, he's a man of sorrows because of how much suffering he had to endure. He had to leave the glory of heaven. Uh, He had to feel the same pain that we feel. Um, Like I said, he was the sin bearer and had the weight of the sin on his shoulders. Uh, But he could rejoice in his suffering as he focused on the final outcome. 
And I look to Hebrews 12, 12, it says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, uh, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. So now we'll look at Isaiah 61, verse 1. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. So I, I underlined in my notes where it says, He has sent, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to fix the brokenhearted to pro proclaim liberty to the captives. Uh, in America, we should know what liberty is. Uh, so that, that means quite a bit to us, to pro proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus reads this passage in Isaiah uh, in Luke 4. Jesus is in Nazareth reading at the synagogue, and he reads, the, he reads this uh, verse from Isaiah talking about himself, which I, it kind of blows my mind. You know, 700 years later, he's going to read this to the people about himself. It says, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon men, because he has, has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all who spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. So I think that's pretty pretty telling that he's sitting there reading this um, about himself, something that was written 700 years earlier. Looking then at Acts 26, 18, it says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Jesus will set the captives free. John eight thirty two, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, they answered him. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answer, answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever, the sun remains forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So here again we see a reference to escaping Captivity, escaping the snare of the devil uh, through Jesus. Uh, Romans seven twenty three through 25. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I, my, then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So it says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord uh, that we will be free from captivity. So what comments might you have about Jesus setting the captives free? Isaiah 6, 61, verse 1. I'm sorry? Free from, sin. free from sin. Freedom. Like I said, freedom's a big deal in this country. Um, if you look throughout history, that's, that's what this country was founded on, was freedom, freedom of religion. 
um, the Constitution, all that. And we look back at uh, Christ, and he's our, he frees us from sin and death. All right. All right, so a quick summary. Our time is winding down. The Messiah will pour out his spirit. The Messiah, the Messiah will be mocked and abused. Jesus would be despised and rejected. And Jesus will set the captives free. So that's my lesson for today. Uh, but I want to hear from you all a little bit. I read lots of scripture from the New Testament that backs up these Isaiah passages where they, they go back and forth and they reference and they have the same type of language um, in the Old and New Testament. So as we talk about Jesus in the Old Testament um, and then back it up with the New Testament, it all, it all fits together like puzzle pieces. It's not just one old book that we no longer uh, need to pay attention to. It all goes together. So how does this, how does this affect your life? Um, Yeah. Yeah, he's borne our griefs and then our griefs means every single one in this room. So your griefs, he borne uh your griefs. So thank you. So how Yeah, so he, he's saying that Jesus was despised and rejected because people couldn't accept that he was born uh, from Mary and Joseph and that he was, he was God or the Son of God. It was hard for people to understand, hard for people to accept. Uh, but even in his life, he's doing miracles. He's doing wondrous things, bringing people uh, healing and uh, life and all that he did. Um, and they still couldn't accept that. And it's hard for us even today for people.
Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's saying that they struggled uh, to, to recognize that, that he was God's son and that we have to do that same thing today. We have to really uh, try to remember who he is, uh, that he is the son of God and that all that he's done for us in our lives. And it's, it's hard for us to always remember that when we go about our daily lives and to keep that in the forefront and focus. And I think that's one reason why on the, on the first day of the week we're called to remember that sacrifice and who he was and what he did for us. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're being cut down like an old tree, and yes, yeah, yeah. And what's sad about them? It's not them, you know. It's their descendants. Uh, so you know they're having to live in that environment before Jesus. And um, I appreciate everybody. And uh, I don't think I outdid Lawrence. I don't think I could ever do that, but. Uh, Hopefully you enjoyed the class and appreciate everybody. See you Wednesday night.